So with our ICPMS, we're performing trace elemental analysis, uh, which means we have detection limits that are very low for the elements that we can analyze for. To give you an example of the range of elements, we can look at this periodic table that's in the ICPMS room. And so on this periodic table, all of the colored uh, elements are ones that we can analyze for. And the colors indicate what their approximate detection limits are for this model of instrument. You can see that the blue colored tiles are our lowest, our lowest detection limits. And these are above the 0.1 to 1 part per trillion range. So we can look for very, very low concentrations of those elements. So let's talk about what type of samples we can run and address some of our sample requirements. A lot of what this instrument is used is to run water samples, but we can also run samples such as soil samples, minerals, or plant and animal tissue. But our first sample requirement is that our sample must be liquid at point of injection. So if we are running any of these solid sample types, we would want to make sure that we're first performing a digestion and an extraction before we can run it on the ICPMS. And the next type of sample requirement is that our samples must be dilute. And by dilute, we mean it must have less than 0.2% total dissolved solids. And total dissolved solids is often abbreviated as TDS. Now we want to base the dilution of our samples based on our knowledge of the total dissolved solids of the samples. And we can find this out in one of two ways. You can either reference the available literature. So look up other reports that have analyzed similar samples and it gives you an idea of what range that TDS is in. Um, or you can determine it experimentally. And let's run through an example. So in the literature, you might find if you are analyzing for seawater, that seawater has a total dissolved solids of between 3 to 5 percent. But if you wanted to determine it experimentally, what you can do is take a 100 mil aliquot of seawater, and then you'll want to filter it and evaporate. And you, um, after performing this procedure, you may have determined you have two grams of solids. And in that 100 mil aliquot of water, your total dissolved solids would be 2%. And so that way, experimentally, you would know how to dilute your samples. Our next sample requirement is that Ideally, we want each of our analytes to be in the parts per billion range. But the range, um, the total range where we can look at each of our analytes can extend from the parts per trillion range up to 10 parts per million as a maximum. Our next sample requirement is that we must matrix match our standards to our samples. And it's important to know what a matrix is. And a matrix is defined as everything that's contained in the sample that is other than the analyte. And 
as a very minimum, all of our samples must have at least a matrix of 1% nitric acid. And we add this, um, it's very important to keep all of our analytes in solution. So that is why that's our minimum matrix. And the reason why we want a matrix match is because it helps us correct for any inconsistencies in sample introduction and helps to correct for interferences. So for our last sample requirement, for some students, the sample prep workshops and the methods development workshops are integrated into the regular program. But for some students where it is not, you'll want to make sure that you contact Jenna as soon as possible after completing the first workshop series and get the sample prep and methods development workshop scheduled. In the meantime, you want to do a literature view of the available literature on available methods and try to come up with a method that you can bring to those workshops. And so to contact Jenna, the best way is to contact her by email, and that is at nelgen at evergreen.edu.